it's surprising to me the number of times I'll be in conversation, perhaps seated next to someone on public transportation or in a conversation with someone who finds out that I'm a pastor or that I teach at a, a Bible college or seminary. And one of the questions that often comes up is, hey, do you think it's a sin to, and then kind of fill in the blank. I have people who don't have any kind of relationship with God at all. You can tell they're not religious at all. But this question that, that often is on their mind is, do you think it's a sin to, because I remember going to churches at my grandma's church, and they said it was a sin to, and then it's something that you can tell kind of is that they like to hold on to and that they heard sometime it was a sin. And they want to know from some ecclesiastical authority or something, well, do you think this is a sin? And it's interesting how often that comes up, but it's also interesting how often we can delve into the same question in our own lives. Is, is it a sin for me to, they kind of fill in the blank. And, and what's sometimes surprising to people is when I respond that sin is not nearly as objective as you think it is. Now, there are certainly some things, I mean, we could we kind of focus on the Ten Commandments, and there are a number of things that we would sort of center on there that we'd say, those, those things seem to be a sin at all times and all places for all people. Worshiping a God other than the one true creator God. Bowing down to graven images to some other God or some other being, not honoring the name of the one true God. Those would seem to be sort of all time for all people in all situations, sin. There are standards of sexual immorality that God has set forth that uh, are not to be violated by any people at any time in any culture. But apart from a few of those very clear basics, there are a number of things that are very subjective, whether or not they're sin. Something that I might do would be sin for you. Something that you might be free to do would be sin for me. You say, well, wait a minute, Dan, I think I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I'm starting to feel a little uneasy. What do you mean that sin is subjective? I mean that sin very often in the Bible is completely subjective. You uncomfortable yet? It's okay. Right? What do you mean subjective? You, you mean it's up to us whether it's sin or not? No, no. I mean something like if someone said, is it a sin to kick rocks? Is it a sin to hit rocks with a stick? No. Well, it was for Moses. What? Because he was told to speak to a rock, but instead he hit it with a stick. And it was a sin so grievous that it is the very thing that kept him and Aaron out of the promised land. What? Yeah, Numbers chapter 20. Moses was kept out of the land of promise, not because the people were unfaithful, not because of some other grave error he committed, but because one time in anger he hit a rock with a stick. And God had said, speak to the rock. But he hit it with a stick and said, and God said, because of your sin, you and your brother Aaron shall surely not enter the land that I have given to you and your people. Was it a sin for other people in the desert to hit a rock with a stick? No, probably not. But he disobeyed what God had commanded him to do. And the more we think about this, we think throughout the Old Testament, is it a sin for a victorious army going into the city or the land they've conquered to take the spoils of war? Well, typically, no, that's not sinful. But what if the city is Jericho and God has said, do not take any of the spoils of Jericho and you happen to be Achan and you go into Jericho and you see gold and silver and a fine garment and you take those for yourself, then it's sin. Because God had commanded him not to do that, but he did it. And not only was it sin for him, the whole army was then subject to this sin within their camp, and dozens died in the next battle, which was lost, because one man disobeyed what God had clearly said. And so we find, in a sense, that sin can be very subjective. And it, and it comes down to not this, hey, hey, do you think it's a sin to, as though in all times and all places, there's some list in black and white. These things are always sin and these things are never sin. It's okay do them as much as you want. The examples could go on and on. Was it sin for a good Jewish man to travel on the Mediterranean Sea? No. 
Well, was it a sin for a good Jewish man to travel all the way across the Mediterranean Sea? No, there's nothing in the Old Testament laws that would say that was sin. Was it a sin to pay for passage on a ship to Tarshish and sail all the way across the Mediterranean to the far known parts of the Western world? No, unless your name is Jonah and you were called to walk inland to Nineveh, then it becomes a sin that we've talked about for generations and generations. And it cost him and a whole group of sailors a perilous journey, a shipwreck, a storm, a whale that's. Well, it comes down not to this list of, well, these things are wrong and these things are right, but rather, what has God called you to do? How has God called you to trust Him? And that's what I mean when I say there are certain things that would not at all be a sin for me, but might be a sin for you, and things that would not at all be wrong for you, but would be a sin for me to do them. Well, you've confused me this morning, Pastor. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? Because the question I want to look at this morning, if we're going to see that heaven does, in fact, offer peace on earth, there is hope this Advent season. Well, how do we find that hope that we're longing for? How do we find that peace that we're longing for deep in our hearts? I mean, this is the Christmas season. We're supposed to be focusing on hope and peace and joy, and we can and we should be. How do I find that for myself? I think one of the simplest truths is that it comes down to, do you trust God? And if you trust Him, if you truly trust Him, are you walking in obedience? I think this becomes the hallmark of whether you know you trust God. If you truly trust Him, do you obey? For Jonah, do you trust God? No, I don't trust his plan for Nineveh. I don't trust his plan for Assyria. I'm going to disobey and go the other direction. It became sin. Moses, do you trust my plan for you and the people? No, I'm angry. I'm going to do what I'm used to. And he strikes a rock with his staff instead of speaking to it. And it becomes sin. Why? Because he didn't trust God. And he shows it by his disobedience. We're going to look this morning at an Old Testament story in the life of King Ahaz. Why? Because one of the greatest prophecies of the Messiah, one of the central prophecies we see fulfilled at Christmas, comes from the prophet Isaiah to the life of this King Ahaz, one of the kings that Micah ministered to. So our study from the Minor Prophets, seeing Isaiah as a contemporary of Micah, here's King Ahaz. And King Ahaz is a man who has to decide whether or not he's going to trust God. We find this story back in Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. One of the neat things about the Old Testament we're discovering is that not only do we have stories in the prophets, but often we can follow up these same stories by looking in the book of the Kings, the book of the Chronicles, or the books of Samuel, and find out what was going on during that time. And so Ahaz's story, we can flesh out a little bit, we can see kind of what was going on in the story of King Ahaz, and there's this question of, can Ahaz trust God? <clears throat> if we go to Isaiah chapter 7, we find Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1, it came about in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, okay, we've got our northern kingdom, southern kingdom, Judah is the southern kingdom, that Rezin the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel. Okay, we've got, we got three people so far. Let's try to get this straight. We've, we've got the land of Judah in the south, and we've got King Ahaz down here in Jerusalem. And then we've got two other names mentioned. We've got Pekah, king of Aram. Oh, I didn't put Aram on my map. He's dead here. And, and then we've got... King Pekah, son of Remaliah up in Samaria, he's in Israel. And we've got King Rezin, where do I have him at? Uh, the king of Aram, which is, is part of Syria. Sorry, a little slow this morning. They've gone up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. So what do we got? We've got little tiny Judah down here in King Ahaz. And we've got these big bullies here who are coming down to wage war against him. 
why does it say going up to Jerusalem? Well, geographically, Jerusalem's up on a mountain. So they're coming south, but they're literally going up to Jerusalem. So kind of sometimes have to remember that. They've come up against Ahaz to wage war against him, but they haven't conquered him yet. What? They're laying siege to Jerusalem. Verse 2. When it was reported to the house of David, in other words, Ahaz camp, Ahaz kingdom, that the Arameans were camping in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook, like the trees of the forest shake in the wind. There's a very real situation going on here. Ahaz and the kingdom of Judah are under attack. They're being besieged by massive armies. This is real. These are real enemies. This is a real difficulty. This is a frightening situation. And God comes, verse 3, to Isaiah. And says to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shudashub. Meet him at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, here comes the question. Take care, be calm, have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted. Because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands, this fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, the son of Remaliah. Iram and Ephraim, the son of Remaliah, they've planned evil against you. I know what's going on. I know it's real. I know you're in a real situation. But verse 6, they've said, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make ourselves a breach in its walls. Let's set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. But verse 7, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor will it come to pass. If, if you, like me, are a fan of the Lord of the Rings, you're like, None shall pass. Like, this isn't going to happen kind of a thing. There's a real enemy. There's a real situation that's causing real trouble. And Ahaz, we would say, has every right to be worried and concerned about this and to be in fear. Because they're a small kingdom under attack by two larger kingdoms. But Isaiah comes and basically says this. Will you trust God? God knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows the situation inside and out. He knows these two. He knows what they've said. He knows they plan to attack your king and put someone else's king in your place. He knows what's going on. And he is asking you to trust him. Will you trust him? And so this was the question to King Ahaz. And we find out, kind of our first point, Ahaz did not trust God. Ahaz did not trust God. We could go to 2 Kings chapter 16 and find out just how wicked he was, how he turned to false gods, he turned to other things, he turns to Assyria for help. Oh, I hope, I hope that, you know, if Syria and Aram and Damascus and Israel are going to attack me, I'll go to Assyria and to Egypt for alliances and I'll seek help from them. But God came to him through the prophet Isaiah and said, Will you trust God? Will you turn to God in the midst of this or not? And he did not trust God. We saw a situation. He has options. Isaiah has said, Trust in God. Rely on him. Don't go to Assyria. Don't go to Egypt. Don't trust in your own armies. Trust in God. Wait for him to act. Along with this, we find the sign given. Isaiah doesn't simply say, well, just trust him. He says, listen, God is with you. God knows what's going on. In fact, God wants to prove to you that he's with you. Look at verse 8. For the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is Rezin. Then another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered. It will no longer be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you don't believe, you surely shall not last. A has these your options. Believe and obey. Don't believe, disobey, and you won't last. But God has a plan in all of this. Verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask him. Ask him for a sign. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, King Ahaz. But you can see that you're wavering, you can see that you don't trust. God is actually giving us, asking for a sign. 
That's a rare offer in the Old Testament. Rarely are we seeing this kind of ask him for anything you want. As high as heaven or as deep as What will it take to convince you that you can trust God, King Ahaz? Ask for anything. Now his response seems almost pious, verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. We have to kind of parse this out in the context and the passage. The basics was he didn't want to know whether or not he could trust God. He had already made up his own mind. He's not being pious here. It's this smooth sort of pious sounding response. But he's already intended to put his trust in the hands of the king of Syria. He's already made his decision that he's not going to even pretend like he's going to trust God. He wants nothing to do with God's offer. Verse 13. Then Isaiah said, well, listen now, house of David. <laughs> Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men so that now you're going to try the patience of God as well? Isaiah sees through it. You're, you're not even going to... You're not even going to try? You're not even going to attempt to put your trust in God in this? No. The decision has been made. Well, King Ahaz, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The Lord will choose what the sign will be. Since you didn't want to choose, you didn't want to take a chance or ask for anything. Here's the sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child, and she will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. There's going to be a sign given to King Ahaz. Now, we, we look at this, but this sounds very, very familiar. And we just sang a, a song about Emmanuel. We had a wonderful song sung for us by the Jacobs family. Thank you so much. Isn't it cool to be in a church that has so much musical talent? A small church, so many different families and people are getting to enjoy that this Christmas season. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. And, Virgin, you got, I think I know this verse. I think I recognize this. This is a part of our Christmas story. But it was a part originally of the story of King Ahaz. And a prophecy given to him that says, if you will trust God, you can ask for anything. He didn't want to ask for anything. Isaiah says, well, God's already decided there's going to be a sign given. There's going to be a young woman who's going to give birth to a son, and they're going to name him Emmanuel, or God with us, and it's going to be a sign for you of what God is doing. And this is one of these amazing things now we've started to see as, as we've gone through the prophets a little more, is that many times these prophecies have a direct revelation, a direct fulfillment in that time and in that place. And there is a child born here in Isaiah 7 and 8, we'll see, in that time and in that place. That is a sign to King Ahaz. That by the time he gets older, he's going to be eating curds and honey. In other words, that, that's traveler's food, that's nomad food. By the time he grows up, this lamb's going to be desolate. Why? Because you choose not to obey. If you choose not to obey, by the time this kid grows up, you're not even going to be in this land anymore. There's going to be a period of captivity. There's going to be a period of exile that comes. There's a direct revelation that happens here in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8 with a child that is born in King Ahaz's day as a sign of his disobedience. But then the amazing thing we're going to see later in the book of Matthew. At the birth of Christ, he's going to say, now this, this is the greater fulfillment of the prophecy for Isaiah. That a virgin conceives and gives birth to a son. That's going to be the much greater fulfillment that they'll look to 700 years later. But, but it initially is prophesied in the days of Ahab. And it comes down to, would he trust God? Would he obey? He did not trust God, so finally we see he didn't obey. We can see his disobedience in 2 Kings 16. We go back to 2 Kings, we just briefly look at a summary of his life. In 2 Kings 16, verse 2. <clears throat> Ahaz was 20 when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He didn't do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He made his sons pass through the fire to sacrifice some of his own children to foreign gods. According to the abomination of the nations, the Lord had driven out before him. 
He sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. We can read then in the following verses about him going to Assyria and looking to them for his help. Verse 8 tells us he takes the things from the temple of God, the gold and the silver dedicated, and he ends up paying that as tribute to the Assyrians. That, that he puts all of his faith and all of his trust, not in the very God who is in the midst of him, but in the Assyrians for help. Because in the face of difficulty, when he's faced with, will you trust God, he decides, no, I cannot trust God. Read the rest of it. Chapter 16 and then the 17, we can see the rest of his works there. The basics are he disobeyed. He wouldn't trust. The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That brings us to the Christmas story. But in the Christmas story, we find some of the same situations going on, don't we? We find a young girl, a young virgin. And God's going to come to her in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 33. Amazing how this verse in Isaiah ties these stories together. Luke 1, 26 to 33. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin. Engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And in coming, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled. At the statement, she kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. What's Mary's situation? She's young. She's engaged to Joseph. She's a nobody. She's of no significance. Little is known of her or her family. We have the lineage, but they're not an outstanding people. They, they don't have wealth or property or standing in society. She's just simply a young woman who's about to be married. And an angel appears to her and says, God's about to do something in your life. What are her options at this point? She's a little shocked. She doesn't know what this means yet. And it seems like her options at this point are, do I trust or not trust? Look at the next verses, 34 and 35. Mary said, how can this be? How can I have a son? I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring will be called the Son of God. Verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed. What were her options in that moment? No way! Not me! No! I don't want this! Are you kidding? You, you know what this is going to cost me? Do you know what this will look like? angel in, in the Holy Spirit and I'm going to have a child, I'm a virgin but you're saying that I'm going to be pregnant anyway and that's going to be God's baby And but there's Joseph and there's my life and my my, fam, my parents, do you know how long they've worked and arranged and his family, everything is set no, no do you know how disruptive this is going to be to my life we look at it, I mean really is this to Mary's life <laughs> From this point forward. I mean, we know the story. We know it so well. We stop to think, how much chaos is this going to bring? What about the public reputation? What do you do? When you show up and everybody knows you're not married. You're just engaged to a guy and say, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. I mean, we, we, we've talked about it. You know the story. But the reality is that's what Mary is facing. Does she have the choice to say no? Seems like it. 
So he was like, no way. No, I'm not going to do this. I don't want this. I, I, I can curse God. I can go off and I can just curse God and choose to follow some other God. Do some, I, I, her, her options were trust or don't trust. Obey or don't obey. And she says, I'm your servant, I'm your slave. Let it be done to me uh, according to your word. She chooses obedience. And interestingly enough, in, in the midst of it, verse 36, there's a sign given to her. To know that this is from God, to know that she can trust him. Verse 36, the angel says, behold, even your relative Elizabeth, She's conceived in her old age. You know, she's too old to have children. Everybody knew she was too old to have children. The story was just told in Luke 1 about how old she and Zechariah were. She who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Mary, there's a sign. God is showing you that you can trust him, but you still have a choice. You don't have to follow the sign. And she chooses obedience. And, and right away, then, what does she do? Verse 39, now at this time Mary rose and went in haste to the hill country, the city of Judea, and entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the baby left in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, blessed is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me? The mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting, Mary, reached my ears, the baby leapt inside my womb for joy. Well, blessed is she who believed there would be a fulfillment of what the Lord had spoken to her. And then Mary gives this amazing response to God we call the Magnificat. My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior. He's regarded the humble state of his mom slave. Behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him. He's done mighty deeds with His arm. He's scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humble. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He's given help to Israel, His servant, in remembrance of His mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary stayed three months before returning home. What an amazing prayer from a simple teenage girl. Probably uneducated, unlearned, not trained in the ways of the law, but what an amazing prayer of one who has found peace with God. Why? Because she obeyed. Because when given the option to trust him or not, she chose to trust and obey. And how amazing it has been for the world ever since. What a prayer. What a revelation. What insight. What depth of intimacy with God she experienced because of her obedience. What carries her through the next years of her life what will carry her as a mother through the next 33 years of her life? Watching and seeing him grow and what happens to her son. And then seeing him on trial and seeing how he dies. Look at the intimacy with God she experiences from the first days of obedience. This prayer does not come from a heart that wavers. This prayer doesn't come from a heart that's sort of iffy with God. This is the kind of prayer that only comes when you obey. Some of you are seeking peace with God. Your lives are full of very real situations that are hard and difficult. Perhaps God is saying, do you trust me? Not just, well, I'm not sinning. I'm not doing this, you know, this list of black and white, all these sins. I'm not, I'm not doing those things. I'm not sexually immoral. I'm not hurting people. And you're probably not. You're not doing any of those bad things. But are you being obedient? to what God has called you to be obedient to? Are you trusting His will for your life? And that's where this becomes very subjective. Not just are you doing all the right surface stuff, which are important things. 
Are you walking in trust? Are you walking in obedience to these personal areas of your life that God has called you to follow? Joseph, faced with a similar situation. Can Joseph trust God? We know his situation. Let's look at it in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We, we just saw that he's betrothed to Mary. Suddenly, she shows up pregnant, and then she disappears for three months. What? Did you forget that part of the story? As soon as she hears from Gabriel, she goes off to visit Elizabeth. Wow, do the rumors back home start swirling. She's engaged. There's rumor now that she's pregnant. Some rumors about angels and visitation. And she's left town for months. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. You're Joseph. You're young. Finally, a marriage has been arranged. It's been agreed to. Everything's in place. You're a carpenter. You're getting things ready for this life together. Maybe you've made a little table for the two of you to sit at. You've made some things for the home that you're going to have together. You're preparing for this. It's all been decided. The families have agreed that... The dowry, the, the price has been paid. You actually are fascinated by this woman who's going to be your wife and you're looking forward to it. She's pregnant and she's gone. She's disappeared. What do you do as a righteous, faithful, young Jewish man? You have the right under the Old Testament law to have her brought before the city elders and stoned to death because she has disobeyed. She has violated the marriage contract. And under the laws of the people, you have that right. That's one of your options. You have the right to see her publicly humiliated and publicly executed. That's how serious this is. He has that right. He also has the right just to divorce her. You see this betrothal on that day. It's different than engagement in this day. And in that day, the betrothal itself was part of the contract. I mean, this is, this is a done deal. You haven't had the wedding yet, so you haven't consummated the relationship. You're not living together yet, but this has been arranged. This has been decided. This has been contractually agreed to. You have the right to publicly break that contract, to to disavow, to annul everything. And Joseph, her husband, verse 19, he calls the husband already, even though we're all together. It's how serious this is. Being a righteous man, he doesn't want to disgrace her. He desires to put her away secretly. He's just going to annul, to... To, to contractually separate, to end the contract, not make it a huge public spectacle. That's how righteous he is. But still, still now, he's confronted with a decision. Because in the midst of this, chapter 20, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. That's a pretty amazing sign. And the angel said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. I know what's going on. I understand the situation. That which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The rumors are true. The things that you've heard, they are from God. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. What an amazing sign is given to him. What an amazing opportunity. But he doesn't have to obey he doesn't have to agree to this. He doesn't have to now protect her, take her in as a wife. 
keep her a virgin until they're married, raise this son as his own. He doesn't have to do any of this. He has a choice. And his choice is this. Do you trust God or not? This is the sign given 700 years ago, Joseph. Do you trust it or no? You don't have to. You don't have to follow. But just like Mary, we saw her obedience, we see his obedience. Verse 24 and 25, Joseph arose from his sleep, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took her as his wife, and he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. He was faithful. He trusted in the midst of his situation. Was it wrong for a young Jewish man to want to end the contract, divorce a woman who turns up pregnant? No, that's not sinful. That's expected. That's actually righteous. Joseph being righteous. He could be a righteous man and choose to divorce her. He could be a righteous, godly man, do the right thing according to the law and divorce her. But guess what? In that moment, for Joseph, that would have been sin. When angel comes to him and says, take her as your wife, this is from God, in that moment, if he follows the law, it would be sin. It would be a grievous sin in the eyes of God. It would be disobedience. It would show that he didn't trust God. Some of us in our Christian lives, we break it down to, well, am I doing, am I doing wrong? Is, is there pornography? Is there sexual morality? Is there dishonesty? Is there some area in your life? And we have people go through kind of this litany of things, and we have them look at this sort of checklist of things that are standards in the Christian life. And are you doing this? Are you not doing that? And if you're doing all these, then you're fine. I think it comes down to something much more central this morning for you. Are you trusting God? Well, yeah, I'm not doing any of those. But that's not what I asked. Are you trusting God? Now, how do you show you trust Him? By your obedience. Well, I'm not violating it. I'm not talking about what would be sin for all people at all time, and some of these Ten Commandment things. Has God called you to do something that you're not doing? Has He shown you something that you're not following? Has He called you to an area where you are being unfaithful? Has He revealed something, maybe in the lessons of the last year, through the Minor Prophets, or Philippians, some area that He challenged you in, and you never followed through with it? I feel like God called us to this, but we need to do that. Is there something in your life that God is calling you to do or to be, to possess, to dispossess, that you haven't obeyed? That's where you find peace with God, in your obedience. There's illustrations of it all throughout the scriptures. There's illustrations of it in some of the great Christian lives of old. One of my favorite people to study and to look at the life of is D.L. Moody, because I was greatly impacted by his life. A man who lived in the middle 1800s, 1850s, he was just a young guy who was selling shoes in Massachusetts. He was pretty good at it. He wanted to get better. His uncle said, I'll give you a job in my shoe shop if you go to church with me every Sunday. So, so young Dwight Moody went to his uncle's shoe shop and, and started making more money, being pretty successful, and going to church with his uncle every Sunday, and that's where he heard about Jesus, and that's where he decided to give his life to Jesus Christ. He had a man from the church come and visit him at the shoe shop one day, Henry Varner, and said, you know, Dwight, the world has yet to see what God can do in and through and to a man whose heart is completely his. Would you be that man? And Dwight said, I'll try. And so he decided to, to become a great success so he could support Christian ministry. So he moved to Chicago to sell shoes from Massachusetts, where he was pretty successful. He thought, Chicago is the up-and-coming city in the 1850s. I can make a lot of money there. So he went to Chicago as a shoe salesman. And young D.L. Moody was great at selling shoes and, and became more and more successful. And through his profits... He supported the young institution, the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, when it was still very much Christian. 
and the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. And he supported those ministries with his finances. And he thought, this is what God has called me to do. And did it very well through the 1850s. And then he had a passion for poor people. And he saw these poor kids on the streets of Chicago, uneducated, unable to attend school without anything. And he's like, they need Jesus. And so he started a Sunday school ministry to kids, which was kind of unheard of in the 1850s. And pretty soon he had hundreds of kids showing up on Sunday morning to hear stories of Jesus. And he got more and more people to help him. And, and over the next seven or eight years, as these kids came into contact with him and they came to know Jesus and they started growing in their faith and there's these young teenagers now and then these 20-somethings who are following Jesus Christ, they formed a church. A, a, a church in the early 1860s, which to this day still stands in Chicago. And it's now called Moody Memorial Church. Back then, it was just a church full of a bunch of poor kids and orphans and street people who were getting to know Jesus. And, and Moody started being asked to speak in revivals all around the nation. And the Civil War hits, and he's asked to speak at Camp Douglas outside of Chicago. It's just one of the training recruitment camps for the North. And he's ministering to hundreds of thousands of men who are going off to war. And they're putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And his ministry grows and grows. Where Before long, he's no longer selling shoes. Now he's traveling all around the world evangelistic ministry all throughout Europe. The, the, the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon has him come over to the United Kingdom to speak in multiple places and multiple times all around the world. It's an amazing, phenomenal ministry. And the whole time the church back in Chicago was growing by leaps and bounds. And he met a woman there in Chicago named Emma Dreyer who had a desire to educate women. And give them college degrees in ministry and in nursing in a way that they can serve the Lord. And so that ministry begins to grow and to grow and to grow. And it's at the height of his ministry in 1871. After a Sunday night sermon, he preaches the gospel to a crowd of thousands. That the fire signal starts to ring in the city. That happened all the time. It's like when you hear a siren go by. There's a fire department right up the street. We hear a siren during church, but we don't even pay attention to it, do we? But the alarm continued to ring, continued to ring, and more alarms started going off. And much like here, if there was a fire truck that went by, it'd be fine. But if there were eight of them that were right out on North Oak, we'd probably send somebody out to see what's going on. And the great Chicago fire of 1871 hit the city and wiped out most of Moody's ministry. The small school that had started, the church building itself, most of the things that Moody had been involved in, gone. Thousands perished that night. Amazing impact in the city of Chicago. But in the days that followed, Moody came to a different realization. This man who had so much phenomenal success in ministry realized that he was doing what he wanted to do for God. And then say, God bless my plans. God bless my opportunity. God bless this. And he was simply doing what he wanted to do. And asked for God to bless him. And he came to a very different place in his life. And he recognized that in all of his successes, he wasn't obeying God. And God called him to a new level of obedience and trust. And from that day forward, Moody said, I'm going to see what God wants me to do and wait for him, and then I will move. And what happened was a phenomenal ministry that went beyond anything that Moody had seen before. There was a day where God called him to get on his knees in a property in downtown Chicago. And he said, Lord, if you will give me this property, we'll build a Bible Institute. And God gave him the property. In 1886, a Bible Institute was founded. That same year, he was in obedience, traveling to the United Kingdom where he preached at Cambridge University. And the Cambridge Seven were formed. If you've studied missions history, seven men who gave themselves to foreign missions for Christ in a powerful way. Shortly thereafter, the student volunteer missionary movement begins out of the teaching and preaching of the El Moody, a movement that over the next 30 years would send more than 5,000 people to foreign missions. 
1886, that same year, there was a revival where Daniel Towner was the music artist, along with Ira Sankey. And Towner was doing the special music. And at the end of this revival, there was a man who stood up in the congregation after hearing the preaching of D.L. Moody. He said, I don't understand it all. But I think I'm going to trust, and I think I'm going to obey. And there was cheering and clapping, and the man came forward and asked his testimony. He said, I don't understand it all, but I think I'm going to trust, and I think I'm going to obey. And Daniel Towner wrote down those words. And a short while later, he and a friend of his, a minister, John Samus, composed a song based on this simple declaration from this revival at Moody of this man who said, I don't understand it all, but I think I'm going to trust and I think I'm going to obey. And they wrote the words to this song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But Dan, I'm doing all of the right things, but are you trusting him and obeying what he's called you to do? Because what he's calling you to do may not be what he's calling the person next to you to do. Your obedience is different than theirs. It's your stewardship, not theirs. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt, not a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while you trust and obey. Not a burden you bear, not a sorrow you share, but our toil he richly repays. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross is blessed, but if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Ahaz did not trust, therefore he disobeyed and he lost his kingdom. His son Hezekiah would trust. And Jerusalem is besieged. And Hezekiah turns to God and says, God, you are the great God of Israel. You are the God of nations. I humble myself in sackcloth and ashes before you. And I trust you to do what only you can do. And the next day... God wiped out 185,000 of the enemy troops by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the battle, the situation, the thing that Daddy Ahaz had feared so much that he disobeyed God, God took care of for his son Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah trusted and obeyed. In fellowship suite, we will sit at his feet or walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fearing, only trusting and obeying. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Mary trusted, and she showed it by obeying. Joseph trusted, and he showed it by obeying. But Dan, they all got a sign. They all got a sign. And so did you and I. Because a young virgin conceived and gave birth to a son who was called Emmanuel, God with us. And Romans 8 said, Can you not trust God who did not even spare his own son but gave him up for us? Can you not trust him? This Christmas we have a sign. We have a Savior who was born. Emmanuel, God with us. And, and this morning, we're going to tie Advent and Easter together by taking communion and remembering God gave up his own son as a sign to show that you can trust him, even in this, whatever your this is, whatever your situation is that you're wondering, can I trust? Do I obey? Do I do that? You can trust him. You don't need to fear we trust and obey. Father, thank you for the gift of your son that shows us we never have to doubt, we never have to wonder if you're holding out on us. We can trust you. <coughs> thank you for the son that the young virgin Mary, who was faithful, conceived and gave birth to a son. And that young man Joseph, who was there in faithfulness and obedience, 
named him Jesus, Savior, God with us. He is our King. He is our Lord. Show us how to obey. Show us what to obey. Knowing that we can trust you. As we take communion this morning, God, thank you. Thank you for this remembrance of how much you love us, how much you care for us, knowing that we can trust you, not just with eternity, but with today also. In his name we